Hello and welcome to our talk about what is happening in the economy and in housing as we go through in an unprecedented crisis. My name is Skylar Olson, Senior Principal Economist on the Zillow Economic Research Team, where we spend all of our time leveraging Zillow's massive data set and outside data sources in order to figure out not just what happened, what is happening, but what is going to happen uh, in the months and years to come. Now, this truly is an unprecedented experience. The closure of non-essential businesses, the requirement in order to social distance, in order to protect ourselves and our loved ones, meant that we experienced extreme job loss. Right now, we're experiencing unemployment rates that we have not seen since the Great Depression. Now, that's causing a lot of uncertainty, uh, but as we all hole up, as we all uh, social distance, as we all self-isolate, as we all self-quarantine in order to help our communities get to the other side of this public health crisis, it's clear that housing has become top of mind. The data that you're seeing in front of you here is search traffic to for sale homes on Zillow. Now, sure, that activity pulled back in the early days of the crisis like activity uh, you know, everywhere, it seemed like, in the economy. You know, that's where you're seeing here these orange bars showing lower traffic uh, during some of the prime uh, you know, new months entering the, the home shopping season relative to the home shopping season in 2019. What was surprising was we saw search activity return so very quickly to the point where at its peak only a few days ago, search traffic was up over 50% relative to 2019. Now it's not just for sale homes. We're also seeing search traffic rebound incredibly quickly on the rental side. Now if you look at these two graphs, and you look at the sheer size and scale of search, you might be tempted to also consider that a lot of this is us stuck in our homes. It's experiencing our homes in a way that we've never really experienced them before. We're, we're stuck here, we're working here, uh, you know, we're shopping online in our homes, we're trying to educate our kids in our homes, and it can start to feel a bit of a burden. Uh, it can start to make you want to look outside, right, on what's available somewhere else, anywhere else. Zillow is a great source where you can do that, right, just to look at homes that are available elsewhere and do what I like to call adult pretend time and imagine yourself in a different place. But what we're going to talk about over the next uh, several uh, over the next uh, half an hour is just how much this search traffic is actually translating into economic activity in housing. Right. First, let's focus on the for sale side of the picture. Now, okay, we saw incredible uh, job loss. We started social distancing. People were spending time in their homes. It became logistically uh, difficult, incredibly challenging in order to do the normal business of housing, which has long required so much face-to-face -face time, right? What you're seeing in front of you here, check out that orange line. That's our pending sales metric. You can see that you know, early on in February, we uh, early February and in January, uh, it was more activity than we had seen in 2019. We were entering a, we, what we thought would be a stellar home shopping season, characterized with lots of uh, more home sales this year than last year, uh, but also a, a return of new listings. That's that blue line, right? So pending sales, that's the orange. Think buyer activity, that commitment, right? Signing on the line, a bid has been accepted. The home moves from active listing uh, into contract. The blue line, think about seller activity, and actually mostly existing homeowners is what we're capturing here, in terms of the, their propensity to list their homes on the market. So again, pre-crisis, pre-COVID, we're seeing higher uh, activity. There was going to be a stellar home shopping season. Okay, then uh, the public health crisis hit and economic activity pulled back significantly. You can see both the orange and blue lines uh, dropping uh, very, very far, uh, reaching in, in many ways, uh, you know, almost having, right, if we're talking about new for sale listings. Now, something, though, that I want you to notice 
uh, is the return of activity. And actually a, a faster return than was originally anticipated uh, when we thought about the incredible depth uh, of the economic crisis and that job loss. So here you see pending sales uh, increasing very significantly to the point that now, believe it or not, believe it or not, now pending sales are 11% higher uh, than they were at this time in last year in 2019. Now that's buyers returning. And one of the ways that we think about why you know, this would be happening, why would buyers have such confidence to return and buy at such an uh, uncertain time is think about all those previous home shopping seasons uh, where we had buyers uh, frustrated with low inventory, experiencing bidding wars. Uh, this was the home shopping season where they were planning to show up and they were ready. This pending sales and this return of buyer activities in many ways are those that were already prepared, already ready, and are pushing forward and making it work because frankly, you can't really stop all of the major life events that often precipitate home buying, right? So you make it work and you push through. Now sellers on the other hand have a bit more optionality or could potentially have a bit more optionality in terms of deciding no longer uh, to sell their home. And we've seen that the confidence in sellers is uh, not quite as strong as a return from buyers. Now we have seen this uh, recovery, however, the rate of new listings coming onto the market still remains 20% below what it was in 2019. Now you put those two pieces together, put the fact that buyers are returning and harvesting the inventory that was already on the market or ready for sale, Sellers have not yet returned and placed new listings on the market for sale. And so overall inventory uh, already, uh, you know, historically low in many ways uh, over the past few years. Uh, and it just continues to be borne down and down and down to the point where now total inventory existing, the pool of homes available for sale uh, in the market is, is, is really at historic lows. Okay, now that blue line reflected those new listings on the previous slide did reflect more the activity of existing homeowners listing their homes on the market for sale, but builders too took a big, big pullback due to the uncertainty. On the left of your graph, you're looking at home builder sentiment reported from the National Association of Home Builders. It you know, really plummeted over the course uh, of April. Um, we've since seen uh, home builder confidence come back up, uh, but it still remains much lower uh, than how we entered the season. Uh, so too goes with sentiment and home builder confidence, so goes starts, right, and beginning those projects. It's not just confidence though, right, we also have to remember that in order to social distance, those are much higher operating costs. It is much more challenging in order to get many of those projects done. Housing starts also fell off a cliff. In many ways, many economic <laughs> indicators fell off a cliff uh, during those early days. Okay, so not only we're not seeing as much or we're experiencing a supply shock from existing homeowners that are no longer listing their homes, uh, uncertainty uh, in pulling back uh, their homes and their listings, but also at the top of the funnel uh, of new housings, uh, builders are pulling back significantly as well. Now, if I put those two pieces together, right, the idea that yes, I had buyers uh, pulling back, um, uh, though they're returning, right? Uh, but I also had sellers pull back significantly. So I had a demand shock and a supply shock. You know, when I have those two dynamics happening at the same time, uh, they actually offset their impact on prices. Um, it's a, perhaps a perverse delight as a dismal economist to give everyone flashbacks to Econ 101 and show you slides like this. Uh, but truly, I, I want to do it because I want to I remind everyone that even though, you know, I think in the top of our minds when we think about recessions, when we think about crisis, we think about demand pulling back, we think about prices going soft, and we think about activity or sales numbers uh, really dropping. But in for sale housing, because we also have this supply shock response because existing homeowners and builders are also pulling back in a big way, that low inventory, lower and lower and lower still, uh, puts upward pressure on prices. Now that's gonna help prices remain stable uh, early days in this crisis. Um, and we'll talk a second about how we expect things uh, to go forward. Now on the left here, you're looking at median list prices 
on Zillow. Now, if you notice in the recent months after January, as we go through this crisis, that median list price started to look pretty darn volatile in terms of jumping up and down, uh, and, uh, and now is actually 4% higher than it was in 2019. When we're looking at median list prices, it's really important to remember that we're not controlling for how uh, the what's available in the market, what uh, the kinds of homes that are listed changes over time. We saw in the early days of the crisis, um, uh, uh, so when list price first started falling, if you see after that first peak when it was coming down, that was more pullback uh, from higher end homeowners, right? Not listing on uh, their home for sale because they could choose to delay, right? They have more wealth, they had more optionality, uh, they could make that choice to not list their home. Now, since we've seen buyers return, we've actually seen those higher end uh, homeowners offer their listings again, uh, and they've returned to the market much faster than lower end homeowners, and that's why you're seeing a bit of the up and down. Now, on the right, we're looking at our Zillow Home Value Index, where we do try and control for the change in the mix of homes. Now, if you see here, uh, our current number has uh, you know, still positive year-over-year -year numbers. Um, we actually haven't even started to see negative numbers yet in the month-over-month -month changes in this index. Uh, but when we look at the raw unseasonal data that underlines this seasonal or the de-seasonalized and smoothed image of our index, we do start to see early days of price softening. Month over month uh, changes are getting much smaller uh, than they have been over the past few months leading into uh, what would have been a pretty stellar home shopping season, whereas you can see from this graph, home value appreciation was heating up again. Now, uh, one of the other reasons why we're not yet seeing uh, home value softening reflecting in this uh, metric is not just because of this deseasonalization or, or the smoothing that's applied on top of our raw metric here, but remember, in order to get a signal from sales, uh, I have to see the sales themselves. We're in a crazy, unprecedented time where sales reporting, always usually a bit lagged, is lagged even more as county offices are feeling incredibly strapped. And so, if we want to think about what's happening about prices, we do turn uh, to our formal forecast to try and get an understanding of what will come in the months ahead and whether or not prices will indeed uh, start softening. Now, on your left, you're seeing our forecast for how prices will evolve over the course of this crisis. Now, check out that blue line. That's the most likely. You know, I, I'm actually been looking at a lot of forecasts from a lot of econ research shops all across the country, and whether they're forecasting uh, here prices or, or home sales, or whether or not they're forecasting GDP uh, and inflation, there's a huge range, right, in, in what we think could be possible, which is why you don't just see the blue, which is our most likely event, but you also see an optimistic scenario, and you see a pessimistic scenario as well. So check out that box underneath uh, or on that left-hand side, which kind of speaks to how likely we think uh, the different scenarios are. I do want to mention that because we saw the quick return of pending sales uh, and, uh, and, and other uh, you know, good jobs numbers and other signals, that this recovery, uh, while a very deep shape, uh, while a very deep V, uh, we are getting more and more uh, uh, optimism over time, even on forecasts for, for GDP, and that's caused us to update the probability of our most likely scenario, uh, you know, this medium, right, um, or, or rather the, the pessimistic scenario, the likelihood there has, has fallen, right? Okay, so what is the forecast? That blue line reflects home values falling from February to October of around 1.8%. So in other words, our forecast is really just expecting a home value uh, drop of anywhere between one to two, right, when you think about the likelihood here, and then uh, price recovery into, uh, well, we'll hit back to those February numbers at around mid-spring uh, in 2021. 
Now, one to 2% home value drop at a national level is absolutely significant. But if you're holding in your mind the last example of a housing crisis where home values fell 25% uh, in the last uh, housing bubble and bust, you will uh, perhaps find a home value uh, hit of only one to 2% fairly comforting. Um, now, check out our sales forecast, right? That's a bit of a different picture. Remember the, you know, our supply and demand graphs, you know, the price impact will be offset uh, by uh, these dynamics of, of supply pulling back and also uh, demand pulling back at, at the same time. But both those shocks take a big hit out of activity. They'll take a big hit out of quantities and out of sales. So here you're seeing a forecast of once we you know, can confirm with, with sales reporting, but our pending sales numbers also reflect a similar magnitude of sales falling anywhere from 40 to 50% in a now cast way, right from those high February levels uh, down into April, end of April and, and May. Now, if you look at the course of recovery and you kind of remember from those previous graphs looking at pending sales, in the beginning, the recovery is pretty fast, right? We're harvesting the buyers that were already ready to show up and participate. Uh, we're harvesting basically the buyers that were lucky, that went, maintained their employment, uh, that had already uh, put their savings in a more liquid form out of the stock market uh, that was then hit. We have buyers that can access credit at a time when credit standards are incredibly tight. In order to continue that recovery, uh, we would need to see an influx of a lot of new listings. Uh, we would need to see credit availability expand. Um, it's unlikely that we'll see uh, that happen. And so the slowdown starts to, or excuse me, the recovery starts to slow down to the point where, as you can see in this forecast, how do we get, when will we get back uh, to those high February levels? Well, it really won't be until the end of 2021. That said, we'll recover most uh, of that economic activity before then uh, because of that, 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 um, that shape, right? Okay. Now, when we think about, sorry, let me go back to the previous slide. When we think about this forecast, we, you know, we have to acknowledge that it's a big deal, right? This is a big hit to economic activity and one to 2% price growth um, is significant on a national level. Um, one of the reasons why we do not think that this is going to, you know, that we'll see home prices fall so dramatically and why we do expect the recovery to initially be very quick, um, as opposed to in your reference, right, the recovery from the global financial crisis and housing bubble and bust of the aughts took years, right? Home values didn't stop falling uh, until 2012, um, and we didn't really see a return of uh, economic uh, activity in terms of building or even sales numbers until, you know, very, very recently, even towards the end of 2019. Um, and it has a lot to do with this, right? The last housing bubble and bust was absolutely driven by excess credit. The problem came from housing, okay? It came from housing. The problem was with housing, okay? Well, there was about four and a half million uh, homeowners that probably, you know, should not have been, who could not maintain payments uh, and then were returned to the rental market quite dramatically through foreclosure. Um, that's that big bubble, right? That was home, uh, home ownership rates uh, really kind of heading all the way up to 70 um, and then coming tumbling down. So then we had excess homeowners. If you notice from this graph, yes, homeownership rates started increasing in 2015, uh, especially as um, you know, we reached a then record expansion and uh, millennials were finally reaching the ages that precipitate home buying, like having kids and, and getting married. Yes, it started to come back up, but it was really nowhere near those highs. We did not have uh, excess credit. We still had very tight credit uh, leading into this crisis. So no excess credit uh, meant no excess homeowners. No excess homeowners meant that we didn't have excess building, right? We, had, we, you know, by no means heading into this crisis, unlike last time, right? Unlike before uh, the, the global financial crisis and housing bubble and bust of the yachts, we did not have excess inventory, okay? We actually had incredibly tight inventory. That again, uh, will help prop up at least prices over the course uh, of this recovery and this experience. So from a seller's perspective, you know, home equity, uh, from a homeowner's perspective as well, not just someone uh, ex uh, expecting to sell their home, but from a homeowner's perspective, 
palm equity is, is much more stable and resilient uh, through this crisis. Now, something though I think we, we really have to acknowledge when we think about who is returning to the housing market, who is able to participate at a time when there is so much uncertainty, uh, who is able to access incredibly low mortgage rates that are pulling people uh, in, uh, to the market. And we're seeing here on the left, mortgage applications are already far above uh, seemingly recovered, right back to those two th uh, excuse me, pre-crisis uh, levels leading into uh, January and February. You know, this in many ways, the people who can access credit, who can buy homes, uh, who can complete those deals are absolutely uh, those that can maintain credit, who maintained employment, Standards for credit are incredibly high. At a time when we're expecting home values to potentially fall anywhere from you know one to two percent, that means people with low down payments uh, are going to have a hard time accessing credit. Uh, at a time when uh, job markets are so uncertain and we're experiencing uh, incredible job loss, right? Uh, those that have uh, well-documented employment that have high credit scores are really going to be the only ones that have access. Uh, to credit at this time. So that's where you're looking on the right from the Mortgage Bankers Association, this Mortgage Credit Availability Index. I think a lot of when we think about this crisis, when we think about this recovery, we are often thinking about the lucky, the ones that can persist, the ones that stay at work, who can uh, work remotely, and then on the flip side, um, the, the ones that are much, much more challenged uh, from, from job loss um, or credit loss, um, income loss, uh, and, and really other hardship, okay? Now, the for sale side, we just made a pretty good argument for why you're entering uh, while the recovery uh, is, is already happening. We're watching it happen. It, it'll, it's gonna slow down. You know, we're watching a pretty fast recovery right now. The recovery is going to slow down, but that's expected, and we'll eventually make it out of the woods without too much home equity loss, and hopefully without uh, too many distress sales or foreclosures or delinquencies entering in the market. Now, the rental side of the picture is a bit more vulnerable, okay? It's a bit more vulnerable. One, uh, unlike the for sale side, we were building uh, leading into this crisis. Um, now, we were building at a rate, you know, far above those 2000 and 2000, uh, excuse me, in 1990s levels in terms of multifamily buildings hitting the market, okay? Um, now, those buildings were concentrated. Um, they were mostly on the higher end. They were mostly concentrated in principal cities. And as much as we had been building so much, right, in 2015, 16, and 17, um, uh, rents were actually back on the rise. Uh, absorption rates had started to increase again. And so you see that spike in January. We were again, uh, you know, uh, starts on multifamily buildings had picked back up. Um, a lot of that, though, remember, was driven by uh, a record economic expansion in, in the rental market, uh, which, you know, is in many ways uh, no longer, okay? Now, one of the reasons, too, why the rental market will particularly struggle um, is because renters themselves are more vulnerable than homeowners. Okay. The homeowner right now is very much so supported by the housing finance apparatus, right? You can access forbearance programs. 80% of mortgages uh, are covered uh, for forbearance programs by the CARES Act, right? Whereas for the multifamily market or rental markets in general, actually, only one in four units uh, are covered by an eviction moratorium in the CARES Act. Now, most landlords, you know, wouldn't really want to evict uh, a tenant at this time, right? Vacant rooms uh, at a time when you, too, have to be, you know, as a landlord, paying up your mortgage, your property taxes, um, uh, property insurance, uh, property management, right? Uh, handymen, all those expenses still need to flow uh, whether or not you get the rent or not. Um, now, when I think about... Uh, so, okay, so renters maybe in the crisis element of it, uh, not really at risk of evictions, you know, the ability to pay your rent during a crisis often depends on your ability to save. Your ability to save, as I'll argue in a second, absolutely matters on the image that you're seeing right here. All across the country, rent prices have exceeded the growth in income. What you're looking at here is the rent burden for market rate 
rents, okay? Now, in many of these markets, uh, rental burdens, even for a, a typical renter, so a typical renter uh, renting with market rate rents exceeds that rule of thumb of don't spend any more than 30% of your income on housing, right? Now, this is for the, the, at the median, for the median household and for median market rate rents. If I look at lower income uh, housing, if I look uh, often at um, uh, housing in communities uh, with more, you know, with black and Hispanic communities, those rent burdens are often much higher. And that's something really important to acknowledge in this crisis when we think about who is experiencing uh, unemployment from uh, non-essential businesses, also tend to be lower income, also tend to be uh, minority groups. Um, that would be struggling more because of this issue and a difficulty in saving. Now, where does that rule of thumb even come from, right? Don't spend more than 3% of your income on rent. Well, it comes from uh, analyses like these or an understanding of this kind of dynamic. What you're seeing here is the ability to save uh, or rather, you know, your inability to save as rent burdens rise. Once you hit rent burdens uh, above 30%, you see a huge share of households that save nothing. And that's not just no retirement one day or no down payment. That's nothing, right? That's no emergency spending. The average household uh, that experiences rent burdens above 45% has $10 in savings with which to get through this crisis. Okay. Now, when you don't have savings, in order to support uh, the rental market, uh, the CARES Act and the extension of the unemployment benefits is absolutely crucial. And I don't mean to imply that it's not crucial for the for sale market either. Um, those unemployment benefits are absolutely uh, to be credited uh, for keeping mortgage delinquency rates uh, low and hopefully uh, keeping foreclosure uh, rates low into the future. Um, but really, when we talk about who's vulnerable from a lack of savings and an inability to uh, weather a crisis and weather an emergency, we are more often talking about renters. Now, the crisis is unprecedented, the support is unprecedented, but it's important to remember that the CARES Act expires on July 31st, um, and that could have huge implications uh, for the ability of renters to pay rent and, in turn, the rental market to get through this uh, healthily. Okay. The graph that you're seeing you here, in front of you here is from uh, the National Multifamily Housing Council. Um, now, what they're projecting or what they're, what they're demonstrating here is, is the ability to, to pay rent, how many people paid rent by the first week of the month, right, in, in the uh, April, May, and June. Now, if you compare the dark uh, blue lines, you can see that April was a much more challenged month at that time. Uh, you know, later on in the month, we've seen the full April data. Um, there was a bit of a catch up, but still, uh, there was a lot of rent non-payment over the course uh, of April. Now, you can see that, you know, comparing the orange bars, May looked a little better. Uh, comparing the, the blue bars, uh, June looked a little bit better still. Um, now, when we think about why, you know, May would look better, even though by then, at that time, we still had not seen uh, job growth returning, um, you know, that uh, came more with the June jobs report. Um, so here we're still experiencing incredible uh, economic uh, crisis uh, and stress. Um, so when you think about the ability to actually pay rent in May, what you're watching is finally getting those unemployment checks. So if we consider uh, the July uh, 31st expiration of the CARES Act and uh, the expiration of the extension of those unemployment benefits, that extra $600 a week, what we'll, what we'll see is, is greater inability to, um, to pay rent. And I think we would absolutely have to consider, particularly for lower end uh, apartments, uh, the challenge that will come uh, from potentially evictions, uh, but also just getting everyone resorted, right, into rental units uh, that they can afford. Uh, you know, we just did an analysis that we released. Uh, 2.7 2 million Americans moved in with their parents or their grandparents over the course uh, of this crisis so far. Um, 2.2% of those are under the age of, of 25. Um, 
So Gen Z is coming home, much like uh, the millennials came home to their Burma parents after the life uh, crisis and, and joblessness, right? Now, Gen Z coming home, you know, a lot of about, you know, nationally, around 13 and a half of renters are in uh, the Gen Z demographic, but it's not just them at all age groups, uh, but mostly on, on lower income spectrums, you would expect people to be pursuing affordability strategies like moving home, but doubling up uh, or trying to shift down the price ladder, which means those lower end affordable units probably won't experience too much uh, rent falling. Now, together with this unprecedented experience comes big, big questions about the future of housing. We just spent uh, a while talking about uh, housing resilience in the for sale market, as well as concerns in the rental market uh, because of the vulnerability of renters. But there are even bigger questions about uh, the future of housing in a much longer sense. One of the most provocative questions uh, that I'm asked all the time is what will remote work bring to the future of housing? Now, right now, you know, almost half of workers who are continuing uh, to work in this environment are doing it fully remote. It is a grand and massive ex uh, experiment in many ways with an all new way to use your home by working out of it. Now, with that experience comes a lot of new frustrations and a lot of new understanding about uh, the pain points of doing that kind of work in your home. On the other hand, remote work offers an incredible opportunity for people to live and work in a whole different way. Two thirds of our survey respondents uh, said that if they uh, got the uh, opportunity to work in the future from their home, they would actually consider moving to make that more sane. That was generally in favor of larger homes uh, and homes with divided rooms. Gone, perhaps, are the day of the open layout that was great for entertaining, but much more difficult in terms of conference calls. Now, two-thirds of people who are newly remote and working from home are not doing so from a home office. Now, together with debate, when we figure out what will this bring, I hear a lot of concerns uh, about the death of American cities as people will move forward and move further out to the suburbs to claim an opportunity uh, to buy homes uh, and work from their home environment because of this new option. Now, something that I want to remind people uh, while we think about these uh, changes that are coming is that in many ways, remote work will absolutely disrupt the relationship between where you live and where you work, but not necessarily where you live and where you play, where you live and where you eat, where you live and where you shop, uh, and all the other opportunities and moments that you do with your time. Now, you can imagine a lot of ways uh, that remote work will involve uh, the housing market without spelling the death of urban areas. And in fact, you know, as Zillow, we turn to the data. Now, here's our uh, analysis of search data, looking at the share of total searches that are going to the suburbs uh, now relative to last year. And as you can see, every single one of these lines actually point to a falling share of suburban search. When we think about the future, you can imagine that the real differences that will come when people recalibrate and adjust for this new opportunity will be the difference between a 45 minute commute and a 60 minute commute when you can work a few days a week. The urbanophile who loved urban living before crisis now has the opportunity to live in a different city every year. Now, there are a lot of things that remote work can change, and Zillow is uh, pretty bullish on the opportunity that it provides in terms of the number of sales in the future as uh, entire economy recalibrates and readjusts to this opportunity. But I really do want to use this, this moment, uh, one, to calm fears about the death of the American city. I don't think that is exactly what's on the table. Uh, but to also cue up the idea that this experience, this change, we're learning a lot. And there are a lot of potential changes that are coming down the pipe. Now, when you think about housing, I hope I've given you moments to be hopeful. I hope I've given you uh, information to understand uh, big concerns. 
But more than anything, I hope I provide an opportunity to look at the data. Looking at data always grounds me in understanding. And during uncertain times, when people are scared, you turn on the lights. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Skylar Olson, uh, Senior Principal Economist at Zillow. Take care.